This is Sue Bird in her exit interviews for the Seattle Storm. Sue spoke for quite a while with media about what her time was like in Seattle, how she plans on spending her retirement, and some of her favorite moments as a member of the Seattle Storm. Hey, Sue. Hi. I just just wanted to ask you, like, um, a big picture topic about your league as you're leaving. Um, you know, we've talked with some of your former teammates now about the prioritization rule um, that uh, will really come into effect next year. You know, just being as someone who was on that mm -hmm. in that committee that's had, that, that helped sort of navigate where this league is going. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you've sort of talked about this before that you can only sort of do so much, you know, yeah. when you're in those meetings. And so, but as you're going, you know, as you, see this league trying to grow. Can you see both sides of it? You, you know, like, I mean, there are some players who are just saying that it, it's not Im, important to them. Like, we need, you know, players here. And yet there's a lot of players who say, no, I still want to go overseas. And the league or the players association didn't really hear my needs. Yeah. Um, it is a... So I was about to say it's complicated. It's actually not. This is one of those cases where multiple things can be true at the same time. That leads to complication, but it's not complicated in that it's a um, like complex scenario. It's just that multiple things are true at the same time. If you go to the start of that conversation with prioritization, um, you know, players, the union, <clears throat> excuse me, um, obviously I was on the executive committee for those talks. Of course, immediately it was met with you're out of your mind. Immediately, I was like, well, that's never gonna fly. And I think what you, the general you needs to understand is um, the league was not in a place where they were gonna negotiate without it. So think of all the wonderful things we got in the CBA, the, you know, 100% maternity leave, um, the family stipend, um, you know, flying, in economy plus or whatever you call it comfort plus depending on where your uh, allegiance lies um having your own room on the road and then of course last but not least the huge salary bumps we all got none of that happens without prioritization that is just the reality that's not a defense that is just what it is so um it's 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 <laughs> it's tricky because <clears throat> you know the the max the max uh, salary was what? I don't even remember what it was when we were, when it finished, like 115, 120, whatever it was, 125? Okay. So it, it's now what? 220, 225, C30? So that doesn't happen without prioritization. Again, this is, I'm not defending it. I, I guess now I can kind of come from a place of like, this doesn't impact me at all. It really wasn't. The CBA negotiation was never about me anyways, and now it truly isn't. Um, so, so you have to kind of you have to kind of understand that to, to really understand how it all went down and how it all proceeded. I think the second thing is, and I'll, I'll say I believe this. <clears throat> I want the WNBA to be the only league people have to play in. I want the WNBA to thrive. I want the the, the schedule to, um, you know, grow and have more games, and we're here longer, and so we never have to go overseas. Because I think what that for me marks is that the league is successful, that the league is growing, which means the finances are growing. You know, sometimes I wonder, it's like if we sign a, a TV deal similar to the MLS's and that injection of cash comes into players' salaries, why do play, you know, I, I would ask myself as a 28 year old, why do you want to go overseas? What's the need? Now I can, now, now I can put on my player hat and, and, and answer the question and say, that money is there now. It is guaranteed in a lot of ways. Um, it's hard to say no to hundreds of thousands of dollars when it's put in front of you. Um, it's also been, I think, our version of a G League for some players in that they've gone, they've been able to go over there. Obviously, um, Rebecca Gardner is a wonderful story that's, that's currently happening, but it, it, it's for all of us. We all go over there, we work on our games, we get to play year round. It keeps us ready. It keeps us fresh. And something tells me that if the WNBA season was six months, you would find, and you were making a million dollars, you'd find a way in the other six months to figure that out, you know? And that kind of loops me back to what is the long term ultimate goal? Um, and it's not to say that the players' needs <clears throat> weren't taken into consideration in terms of playing overseas, 100%. But then it's like the league wasn't going to negotiate without it, <laughs> you know? 
that's just kind of the, 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 the reality. So that was a risk that the league was willing to take. That's, I'm, you know, of course we said that. Okay, what happens if your top five players don't come back to the WNBA? And, you know, not in these words, but I think the, the sentiment was, well, the league hasn't been able to grow with those players here. So at some point we have to change something up, if that makes sense. So it, it, it's tricky, it's tough. And again, I'll end with <laughs> multiple things can be true at the same time. And I think that's what's happening here. Um, and it's a big risk and we're all crossing our fingers that, that it works out. Kevin? You mentioned last night, sense of ownership you feel with this franchise. <laughs> yeah. Have you given thought to what kind of role you would like to have with this organization? Something, oh. If there's something formal going yeah. forward? I don't know. Yeah, I, I haven't given it much thought. Um, yeah, I haven't given it much thought. You know, I'm, I'm not even sure what the actual options are. <clears throat> um, I, I don't see myself in the roles that I know exist now, if you will. I'm just like throwing out titles. We These, these roles are already... Um, filled, so I'm not talking about, but like there's coaching, there's GMing, there's, you know, things like that. I, I don't know that a traditional role is, is really where I would see myself anyways in any organization. Um, so I don't really know even know like what the options are in terms of how to stay involved, but I feel like if that's, you know, what both sides want, we can figure something out. Hey Sue, Hi. what did you do last night after the game? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Just Chill. Kicked it. Yeah. Just, kicked it. Just to go back in terms of your role, have you thought about a global role? I mean, because you're non-traditional, you know what I mean? Just yeah. basketball ambassadors, whatever that would. Yeah. Um, no, I haven't thought about much at all, to be honest. Um, I know I'll stay involved, obviously, and I've, I've already said some of this, um, you know, whether it's some of the things that I already have set up and uh, that are in place, like having together and, and the work they're doing that's in its own way a global ambassador, right? Being able to you know, share people's stories and, and, and work in, in that way. Um, I have like my own little uh, uh, fuck, brand, I hate saying that, but <laughs> it's like I have my own little lane over here where you know, I can, and the one, the, the one that I keep coming back to is the Peyton's Places that I'm gonna be doing this year. Um, just because that one's kind of like already said, it's already been announced, so I can talk about it. Um, stuff like that, you know, for, for me to get involved and, and kind of both um, explore things in, in myself and, and what maybe I want to do as just like as a human, but also it's going to be about basketball. So th there's ways in which I'll be able to talk about that. And there's, th there's all kinds of stuff that's, that's, that's being set up and is kind of in the works. Um, you know, I already have a position on the board at USA Basketball. Um, you know, it's it's almost a shame that the World Cup is happening so fast because I could have I could have foreseen myself going as some sort of you said the word ambassador, so I'll use it. You know, um, it just feels too soon to like be traveling, but yeah. So I think it's it's a big TBD. That's really the answer. But the good news is that there are things that are kind of already in motion, and and we'll just see how it all plays out. And I feel really lucky that I don't have to rush into anything. You know, there's no pressure to do anything. Uh, um, so I feel good about that. On that note, when you woke up, when your eyes opened up today yeah. and you woke up. I was like, oh, I have such a headache. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, what was that after the headache died and yeah, no the practice? Headache didn't die. It's still going. Um, yeah, I, I, I truly don't think um, the idea that I'm retired from the game, like the actual game of basketball, is going to sink in for a little bit because this is always what it feels like at the end of a season. It always feels abrupt. It always feels like, oh, I don't have practice today. That's always how it feels. So it might take, who knows, weeks, months, maybe it'll be you know, a scenario where, okay, usually I start working out now. Susan's not texting me, telling me what to do. You know what, oh, this is different. And part of me is like, maybe it doesn't happen for months, you know, because the WNB, once this WNB season ends, it's usually, you know, we don't have to think about it till April. Obviously, I'm preparing for it, but you're not actually thinking about it. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not really sure yet. It, it, nothing has hit me this morning. What does that time off right now look for you um, to kind of recoup, gather yourself before <laughs> you dive into all of these endeavors? Yeah, honestly, just hanging out. I know it sounds kind of wild. I think, um, you know, part of it is um, this is 
I think part of it is like, this is what typically happens when the season ends. It's not like I go on a vacation right away. That never works out. Um, you can't really plan it. Obviously, as you're going through a season, you don't know when it's going to end. Um, there are some things that I do want to do, like visit some people, see my family, see my friends. Um, so that that is there. But I mean, I literally might go home and for the next like two weeks, maybe clean out my closet. I don't know, get to do things around the house that I've been putting off for a while. That, that, that might be the answer. And, and I'm okay with that, you know? Um, again, because I have these things set up and they, they're, they're not immediate, but they're in the next, you know, couple months or so. Um, I don't feel, I feel like, okay, just chilling. You know, it doesn't stress me out. Um, you really received all of your flowers this year. That farewell tour was well-deserved and incredible. Did the season feel the way you felt it was going to when you made that announcement? And then do you have a highlight on court that you're going to think back to? I, I'll never forget this moment, whether that be that three shot or any other moments. <clears throat> um, yeah, the farewell tour was amazing. You know, I, I didn't know what I was getting into or anticipate what it was going to be like, but, you know, couldn't have asked for 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 a better send off just all the love um obviously here in seattle but you know even on the road just seeing the turnout seeing the different you know whether it's like people wearing my jersey or people wearing t-shirts or people having my shoe or people um, making signs just all of the above it, it was incredible and i'm really glad that that i did that um i wasn't sure that i wanted to and and, and now it's like i can't imagine um i think some of the standout moments are you know the game in new york I'll kind of go chronologically. The game in New York, um, my final home game in Seattle. Um, I think those two are probably the ones that stand out. You know, I'd like to say the three, the three I hit in game three. Um, <sighs> really could have been a storybook, huh? <laughs> yeah, but you know, we didn't win that game, so it's like, what does it really mean? Um, and last but not least, again, like even though last night was the end of the season and we didn't end with a trophy, um, it still was incredible to, to have that happen on our home court. I, you know, I thought about it at some point last night. It's like, oh, I would have loved to have played in a game five. Absolutely. To have a chance to go to the finals. Wouldn't, yeah, I'm not saying I'd, I'd prefer to lose at home, but was there something nice about having that happen on, the, on, my home, on our home court? Yeah, there was. Okay maybe related to the last question big off season for the storm with only two players yeah. under contract do you yeah, want to be I don't have to stress out <laughs> do you want to be involved in in helping recruit players here um, even just answering questions for people yeah yeah i can definitely be um whatever resource you know whatever way i can show up whatever i can i can do to help absolutely but yeah it's a huge it's a huge off season how many people are under contract two yeah well the good news is that means they have a lot of money to spend so you can you can you can frame it that way um but yeah it's a big off season so uh we'll see what happens and yeah i would i would definitely love to help in any way hey just what, just what type of um nuggets i i i guess have you given stewie and jewel as you sort of pass the baton on to them mm -hmm. um to like take over this team if Stewie comes back. Yeah. And and then also just any advice to the next point guard, like the person that fills your shoes, like I wouldn't want to be that person. Yeah. Um, I'll start there. Nobody has to fill my shoes. Um, that's not how it works. I know that's how it gets talked about. That's how people frame it. Um, but that's not the reality. And I think every point guard that has come here, really, really more so starting, starting with Tanisha Wright a little bit, um, that was a little different because what was happening with T is, is that she was in a point guard, but being asked to play that position. So our, and, and we're closer in age. So our relationship was a little different. Um, and we helped each other. It wasn't like a mentorship type of a vibe, but it, it, I definitely started to like understand how I can, how I can help people with her. That's probably where it started. Um, Cause prior to that, all the backup point guards were older than me. So it wasn't, <laughs> you know, um, it really, really began when Jordan got here. And the first thing I said to her was, you're not me. And I followed that up with, and I'm not you. So no one's going to be able to do the things I did because those are unique to me. But I can't do the things Jordan Canada does. 
name a point guard. I can't do the things Lindsey Whalen does. I can't do the things Becky Hammond did. I can't do the things Courtney Vandersloot does. It's just that's not how it is. And I understand why the narrative is filling the filling of the shoes. But I think whoever does become the next point guard of this team, they just have to make it their own. And that's all they, they can focus on. It's not about comparison. They have to, you know, blaze their own trail, you know, throw in every cliche you want. Um, that's the reality of it. And I think that's true for everything, you know, when, you know, Coach Ariema retires, whoever gets that job, I'm sure it's like, oh, who wants that job? And that's just, that's just the kind of the reality of how this goes. But another reality is they just have to make it their own. And, and that's, that would be the advice I would give, not to, not to compare, not to try to, um, you know, match anything, but just make it your own. And, and as long as you're trying to do that in, in, in your work every day, um, I think you can, you know, probably be successful, maybe even more successful. But it's a trap to try to fill shoes, I think. Um, in terms of Jewel and Stewie, <clears throat> um, I think early on, it was just about kind of showing them what a professional athlete does, what, what it means, what it is, you know, how to prepare, how to represent a franchise, how to, um, you know, be that person that takes on all the responsibility. Um, I think they're really lucky in that they have each other. So that's always been beneficial. But I think early on, it was really about teaching like two 21, 22 year olds, excuse me, how to be a professional. It was that simple. And for the most part, yeah, of course I talked to them along the way, but for the most part, I just tried to do that by example, just kind of show them what it meant um, to show up in that way. I think as time went, I remember probably by, probably by 2018, I was actively telling them like, this is not my team. This is your team. I know why you think it's my team. And of course it'll always, you know, quote unquote, be my team and be my franchise in some ways, but it was very much their team at that point. I was there to support them, not the other way around. And they're very sweet. And I know this year, you know, I've caught a couple quotes every now and then where they like wanted to win for me and all those things. But um, the reality is like, we're all here to support them and I'm part of that group. So that, that really, I feel like that, um, you know, transition started around 2018. It really became their team. And then once, once that, like, I feel like once that was said and established, then the next couple of years really became about just like sharing any knowledge I could basketball wise, you know, um, whether it's, you know, things I've seen other players do in their positions and trying to be like, hey, I, like in my mind being like, okay, I saw so-and-so do this. Like, hey, let me tell Stewie. But then simultaneously, like I know their game so well. I know their game so well. So for me, it was always about both setting them up for success and putting them in positions to be successful on the floor, but then also like being able to talk to them about why they're in those positions and what can happen in those positions. Um, and they're with sponges, which has been amazing. You know, so whether it's talking to Jewel about different ways to get open or, you know, talking to Stewie, like I, I, I personally think, you know, Stewie's, and I know the mid-range game is dying in a lot of ways, but the ways in which Stewie can pull up in the mid-range is really what makes her unstoppable. Amazing three-point shooter, getting better and better off the dribble, that'll have to continue to grow. Can do what she does on the block, that'll also have to be become... You know, I, I always, Stu, and I tell her this, I'm like, be careful. I've seen a lot of post players, they start down there and they just like slowly drift to the three-point line. And I get it. She's getting beat the fuck up, pardon my language, every goddamn game. I mean, it is unbelievable the ways in which she gets, it's all teams can do. So obviously that's going to be how something, but which, what they can't stop is her mid-range. They can't stop it. She raises up, she doesn't even see you. Asia Wilson, Defensive Player of the Year, and she did an amazing job. She doesn't even see her when she pulls up, she doesn't even see her. It's like, she's not even there. So, you know, just little things like that, like just trying to, to kind of plant little seeds in their ear, because I feel like what, what I found is those little nuggets, those little seeds that you plant, you know, in practice every day in the course of a game, eventually they, they're able to like pull, you know, pull on those, not on those, but they're able to um, like pull that out in a game. They don't even realize that it. it's like subconscious and they just do it. You know, like I, I, I've been, I learned this from Brian Agler actually, but one way in which you can get foul calls, it's not tricky, but in the WNBA, what, I, what Brian used to tell us, and, and when you start to see it, if you let players stick to you and just phys like be really physical and muscle you around, the refs don't call it. 
but if you if you get to them, but then you bounce yourself off, and then there's there's some bouncing that happens. That's when the ref calls it. And I started to see Stewie, and I told Stewie that I was like, "Listen, what Brian Agu used to say, and it's true." And I told Stewie that, and like I actually started to see her like implement it, you know. And who knows if she consciously did it or not? But it's like those little moments where I actually get, um, it's very gratifying to know that that I've helped her grow in her game. Um, and I could I could do the same thing with Jewel and things that I've seen in her and the things I've helped her with. But that's really so. Just to quickly answer your question, that's kind of been like the progression of I feel like how I how I've been able to to kind of pass this baton and 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 let them be, um, you know, let them take over and be the 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 faces of this franchise. Okay, we're gonna move on to Zoom. Jeff Brown, please go ahead. Hey Sue, first, just it's been an honor in your career. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, Siri was trying to act up there. Uh, anyways, um, just talk to me, you know, last year in Everett, the one more year chant and everything, and it, it got you to come back. Just talk about, obviously you didn't win the championship, but just, uh, everything that you got to experience this season, being at climate pledge arena and getting to experience that and everything, like, what did that mean to you? Yeah, it yeah. was, um, whoop, is there like echo? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it was, it was wonderful. I really, you know, other than winning a championship, couldn't have asked for a, a better season in terms of the celebration of it. Um, just soaking it all in, being able to play in climate pledge was, was amazing. It, it, it's really such a fun arena to, to be in. Um, I think the fan support all year, I mean, we led the league in attendance, which is incredible. Um, and the fan support all year, it was just so much fun to, to experience that. And again, for me to soak it all in. Um, and yeah, I mean, I gave everybody one more year. It's what they asked for, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, you know, even though the fans chanted one more year, it was, um, it was something I wanted as well. And, and I'm really get, glad we all got to experience it. Um, Jackie Powell. Excuse me. Hi, Sue. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, you, you talked about prioritization. And so a question I have for you about that is the CBA was signed before COVID-19 was a thing. And so I'm, I'm curious if you think maybe that was or that is a factor in this hysteria that is, or hysteria might be too strong of a word, but in the worry that, um, is now coming with prioritization. You had COVID, you had two years where economics were a little bit different in the league, and now we're sort of creeping up on that. I wonder if you think that has made a difference. I actually can't tell. Do you mean like in a good way or a bad way? I guess in a bad way, but just in that with COVID, you sort of, you had a bit of a speeding up. Um, oh, yeah. Um, Man, it, it, it's a tough question to answer just because and this is not me wiggling out of it. It's just like, it did happen. Mm -hmm. It kind of is what sure. it is. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can't go back and change anything. Um, mm -hmm. You might even be able to, we didn't know this in the moment, but you might even be able to make the argument that this is such a weird argument to make, but that the pandemic helped us. I'm, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like tentative to even say that. No, but, I get it. I do. Yeah, like think, think about the bubble season. Um, yeah. You know, if you just kind of for a second silo basketball and, mm -hmm. and you can't really separate basketball from what was happening in the world in that moment. Um, but just for a second, we were on TV more, you know, mm -hmm. like all these little weird mm -hmm. positives came from it just, just in that one um, aspect. Um, I think what the pandemic also did um, given what was happening from a social justice standpoint is it really highlighted some of the like atrocities happening in our country. Mm -hmm. And that is what our league stands for. It's, it's what our league represents. Um, so now all the things that were being, you know, for lack of a better held against us were now things that people in our, our world couldn't do anymore. They were being held accountable for racism for homophobia, you know, being held, sexism, held accountable for those things. And that's, that's those three issues obviously impact the world, impact the WNBA a ton. So I know the economics may have had a hit, you know, across the board, obviously everybody in the mm -hmm. world was impacted by that pandemic. Um, 
and again, we can't go, it happened, so it is what it is, and now we have to move forward. And, and you could maybe argue, though, that the WNBA, that is part of its, its turning, that is part of this corner that's been turned. Um, so I don't really know how that answers your questions in, in terms of prioritization. Um, and it's tough, I think, prioritization, I think, you know, I'm just thinking back on my first answer. It's like, there are some players, you know, like Brianna Stewart's really lucky. She has tons of options. A player mm -hmm. like Brianna Stewart is really lucky. She has tons of options and both on the court, off the court, you know, for her, it's, it's just about a choice. I think there are some players that don't make the max money in the WNBA and do make a lot of money overseas. And in some ways that's not a choice. And that group of players is, is impacted differently. And, and that's, that's definitely, again, if I put my player hat on, you know, if I was 28, 29, I wouldn't be thrilled about this either. I wouldn't be thrilled about this either. either. Um, and then, and then at the same time, I think five years from now, and again, that TV deal is going to tell the story of all of this. That TV deal, if that gets negotiated in the right ways, and these networks or a streaming service, whatever it is, steps up in the ways that they should, um, stops hiding from the fact that people do watch the WNBA, people do crave it, people do want to see it, the numbers are now showing us that, that TV deal could change this whole conversation. Could change this whole conversation. And then every player, no matter what the, I guess, level they are, will have opportunities here to earn the money they deserve and not have to go overseas. Thank you. Um, Chantel, New York Times, go ahead. Hi, Sue, this is Chantel. Um, just last night, Becky Hammond compared beating you to beating Serena Williams in her last match at the US yeah. Open. So I was just wondering, have you taken any lessons or any takeaways from other great athletes who have retired like Serena Williams or say Michael Jordan retired and came back, retired and came back or Tom Brady who also <laughs> keeps on retiring. So have you like looked at those figures and, and taken any lessons from them? Um, not the unretiring part. Um, I think, um, no, that's, I mean, what Becky said is, is very, um, it's very sweet. It's funny. It's also a huge compliment. I, I, I know what she's saying. Cause I think we all watched when, you know, Serena was playing in the U S open kind of knowing it's probably her last time there. And when she lost, it's, it's, it's this moment of like, Oh, like that's a bummer. Cause you, you kind of want those, those athletes to have that moment where, you know, they hold up the trophy at the end and all that stuff. Um, so I, I know what Becky means because that's how I felt watching Serena. Uh, but at the same time, and, and I think this goes for Serena as well, it's like, yeah, that's the last game, but it's not the story. I've been saying that all year. It's not the story. Um, it's not the story of a career. It's just the last moment. Although I do think it's funny that I started my career with a layup and I ended with a layup. There weren't very many layups in between, but that's kind of ironic. Um, but yeah, otherwise, it's, it's, it's more just, uh, it just, yeah, it's, 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 it's a compliment. Uh, because I know she wasn't, I'm sure she was not like, oh yeah, we should have let them win. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to wrap up on Zoom, Christos, go ahead. Hello, Sue, thanks for doing this. Thank you for your time, first of all. Uh, walking, out, walking off the, uh, the arena last night, what, what was your thought? What was going to miss you most about the game, about the team, the camaraderie that you, brought, that you created with your teammates and stuff? And did you realize how big is your impact to the community, to the younger, uh, younger ages about basketball and life as well? I, usually I can work with you. I, that was a tough one. What was the question? <laughs> what was my feeling walking off? And then yeah. What was yeah, the, uh, the question is, what, what was going to miss you most about, the, about basketball? And did you realize that how big is your impact to the younger ages about basketball? It's about your attitude on and off the floor. Um, yeah, I think the, one of the hardest parts about um, retiring is, you know, not being in a team environment ever again. That is 100% one of the hardest parts. Um, it's really hard to you know, duplicate what that environment is, what it feels like. It's, it's such a safe place. Um, I touched on this last night. It's your... You're, it's so unique and intimate in this way because you're like really, you know, going to war with people. Um, and, and, and having that relationship is super special, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's, 
I'm probably going to miss that the most. Am I going to miss the games? Yeah. Am I going to miss these moments, you know, or the championships? Yeah, that's definitely a part of it. But um, even when you're in the middle of a career and people ask you like, oh, what's your favorite memory of the, you know, pick a year, 2010 season. It's very rarely does, does someone say like, oh, the moment we won the championship. It's like, nah, it's like some funny story that happened on the bus or like, you know, somebody tripped and fell in warm ups and we laughed or, you know, dumb stuff like that. Like those are the moments like that's what makes this special. Um, so I am definitely going to miss that the most. And I think this year's team, you know, we were we were a new ish group. And so it was really fun to, to, to kind of feel us all come together and, and you know, hit our stride the way we did late in the season. Um, it definitely makes you wonder if, you know, if we would have done that sooner you know, what would have happened. Um, but that's the story of all teams. It happens when it happens. It's on its own time. It's kind of like when a kid walks, like, yeah, you want them to walk. Well, actually, I don't know if parents want them to walk sooner because then you got to really watch them. But um, you get my point. <laughs> Maybe potty training is a better one. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so this, it, was, it was really great to be and fun and, and um, rewarding to, to kind of be on this team and, and looking back, like, at, at the journey of it all. It was, it, was, it was really fun to be a part of that. Hey, Sue, um, you were like a big reason for like Tina and Charles coming here. And it's always tough when someone comes in the middle of the season and yeah. getting them sort of, you know, uh, acclimated with, with what, what you guys do. Um, but did but did that whole thing work with, with her coming and, and just all of that? And I, and I ask you because she's the only player who opted out of these sort of interviews here. And so I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, did, did that work? Yeah, I don't think we get to where the semis without her. I don't think we finished fourth without her. Um, that is both a um, sign of her talent, but also a sign of, to nobody's fault, like Sadie's not being able to play. You can't go through a season with three post players. That's just not a reality. Like that would have been really difficult. Um, we would have been scrambling to, to figure things out for the remainder of the season. And I don't know how many games we had left when Tina arrived, um, but that would have been too much to overcome with just three post players. But then to add a, a player of her caliber, it's literally the only reason we got to where we got. And you can argue that, I, I, this is not about Vegas, what I'm about to say, but you could argue we, should, we could be in the finals too. And we literally would have only been in the finals because of her, like because of her addition, I should say. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, that's definitely the story to me. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.